What's up, everybody? I'm Thomas J. Beleza, and welcome to another episode, a lesson uh, from The Right Mindset. Today, we are going to go over three ways to get readers to care about your novel's characters. Some elements we will see is you might love your characters, but for some reason, they're not resonating with your readers. We'll go over in this video three ways to get the readers to see what you see in your characters. And the third reason might surprise you. See what I did there? A little anticipation. <laughs> Hit the intro. Yes, today's lesson is three ways to get readers to care about your novel's characters. Uh, before we get started, if you're a beginner or advanced writer, author, or screenwriter, click the subscribe button and hit the bell icon so you don't miss out. Uh, mostly what this channel goes over is lessons about our craft, analyzing, reviewing, storytelling, and of course, we do interviews with fellow writers. All right, something to root for. Have a point of view. What makes us see a character is their point of view. There are things that make them feel three-dimensional. When they come about... When characters care about things, especially things you care about, the reader roots for their purpose. See, brand is about a person's missions, morals, and purposes. Characters should have missions, morals, and purposes. Missions are external wants. Morals is how we act out those wants and desires. And a purpose are your internal wants, okay? A mission might be that they want to fight, they want to make right something they did wrong in their past. That's their mission. So now you have to show them making, you have to show them making an effort, even if they fail from time to time, to make right what they did wrong in the past. Morals are their stances on who they are and what they believe to be right and wrong. So not that you have to write out a list, but you should know their morals to help guide their choices. When you know this, then show their choices, their morals, in action based on how they speak, act, or react to things. So how they feel inside will dictate their choices. And to sum all that up and clean it up with a purpose is more than a mission. It's something that drives their truth. These are things that give a person fulfillment. A mission is a want. A purpose is something that drives them, fuels them, and gives them hope. A purpose, a purpose, a purpose is usually something that is internal. It's the thing that keeps the dream alive. So missions are wants that need to be accomplished. My mission is to do X, Y, and Z. My purpose is the why I do it. My morals are the how I do it. Example of each. First, a mission. <clears throat> Derek wants to get his band signed. These are his wants. Every action he takes should be to get his band signed. In a book, he'd take action to meet record labels, record an album, find a band, do shows, network, etc. So in a book, in a story, it would just be that process. They have they create the motivation or their desire, which is in Act 1. And now we see them in Act 2. Uh, they're setting up meetings and meeting with the record labels. Uh, rec you know, they record an album, they find a band, uh, they do shows, they network. And like the midpoint would be them getting signed. And then maybe after they get signed, some crap happens and then they have to find a solution. Is this the life they want or not want? But that's their mission is to get signed, have a band, go through the process, etc. The morals in that example would be who he is and what he believes is right and wrong. So an opportunity to get his band signed comes, but at the cost of having to fire the band. 
does he do it or does he not do it is the moral. Is he loyal to his friends, his band, or is he loyal to his mission? What he believes is right is going to be correct. It's who he is. But if the reader hates that he chose the deal over his friends, they probably won't root for him. However, if he does choose the deal over his friends and then changes his mind at the end of the story, well, there you go. Character arc. Now, the purpose, again, drives them. It fuels them and gives them hope. Getting signed means he can afford to help others and open doors for people who have the same dream. So Derek gets opportunities to play shows, but he helps get other bands on the show because he thinks everyone deserves a chance. So that's his purpose. He's fueled. He goes, if I could get more power or more influence in the industry, I could help others who struggled like I did, and therefore they could have a dream. So to sum up, something to root for, have a point of view. In this situation, if you can understand a character's missions, morals, and purpose, you'll understand what their desired want is, basically what they want to accomplish in life, how they will do it, their morals, there's why and why not I do things, and their purpose, what drives and fuels them, the hope of their success. And it's usually not a purpose fulfilled through money. It's a purpose of something internal, like the, the, it's, it's, a, it's important for them. You know, it's sort of like, for example, especially if you, you've been following my channel for a while, I'm a cancer survivor. But before I had cancer, I had other family members who had cancer. I had family members who passed, some that did not pass from cancer. And a lot of my uh, nonprofit stuff or charity events that I would do with music, comedy, or, or even acting, uh, if I put shows on, would be to raise money um, for cancer. So my mission was to bring cancer to the forefront, um, help raise money for cancer, uh, you know, to ultimately help others. My internal reasons, my purpose is because cancer had affected me so deeply that I didn't want others who had dealt with cancer in one, one way or another to have to go through that same pain of uh, either being sick like I was or watching someone you love and care about be sick and go through their battle, even if they do survive. So my purpose, my internal purpose was I didn't want others to feel what I felt. So my mission was to make sure that we could raise money uh, to fuel uh, the chance to cure that uh, situation. Right. And my morals were how I went about it. Uh, in this sense, my morals are I love seeing people laugh. I love seeing people think and gather. So I would do events to gather people, usually to make them laugh or entertain them or make them think. And um, I would get people involved and have them speak. And so my morals were making my choices to be more involved with others and allow the community to get involved. Okay. Good or bad, what is redeeming about them as in your characters? No matter what your characters do, they need to have a save the cat moment. A save the cat moment is very early on in the story where we meet or see our protagonist do something nice that makes us like them and say, I want to follow this person's story. By the way, a pro an antagonist can have a save the cat moment too. So despite our belief that they are the villain, or the antagonist, uh, they have some redeeming qualities that make us go, okay, I I'm in for the ride. Anyway, Part of the save the cat element is it's important to have it because you want your audience to be sympathetic or empathetic towards your protagonist. If we look at Aladdin, okay, one step ahead of the bread line, one rip ahead of the munch, right? Aladdin almost gets caught for stealing the bread, then he doesn't eat it. What does he do? He gives it away to a few kids who are hungry. So basically, he almost gets caught, almost gets killed. If he did get caught, he would lose his hands or worse. Uh, and instead of eating it, he decided, let me give it to these kids. And that's the save a cat moment. I also believe there is a redemption throughout a story with characters. So when I write a character, I don't traditionally have one big save the cat moment. But when they make mistakes, do they do right by that mistake? And if they continue to make mistakes, how often do they do right by it? No matter how arrogant your characters are, at the end of the day, do they help people even if they take the attention for doing so? 
Who are your characters when it comes to their failures, their bad choices, and what they do with those choices? These are things to really think about when you're working a character based on if you put them in a situation or something happens, what is the reaction through your character? How do they react? Uh, and the thing is, the redemption arc can happen early or later or right in the middle. It doesn't matter. But the, the redemption arc is just that whatever it is they do that puts them in a bad light, they, they put the effort in to redeem themselves. As an example, if your character was a douchebag, the majority of the story, no one would like them. However, if your douchebag character was the one who went behind everyone's back and got Lily and Marshall back together, you'd see them in a different light. In How I Met Your Mother, spoiler alert, Barney is a pretty bad character when it comes to having good qualities that redeem him. He's he's a, he's not a not a nice man, quote unquote. When you find out that he pays to bring Lily back or that he has grown through the show from the beginning to the end, this is what we connect to as an audience, which makes following the journey a second time even more interesting. We know he is a funnier. He's funnier now because we know he needs to go through this to find his truth. That's some of the genius about a redemption arc is that, you know, using Barney as an example, the first time we watch it before we learn the truth. We're seeing his behavior and he's not redeeming himself. He's just not that person. But we know that behind the scenes, he doesn't want people to know the truth of his pure intentions. And yeah, you can argue that he wanted to get Lily back together with with uh, Marshall because he was sick and tired of listening to Marshall, uh, you know, be annoying and, and whiny and all this stuff. But in reality, Marshall and Lily represented the purest form of a relationship. And Barney kind of represents the most unpure version of a relationship. And he sees them as something beautiful and they shouldn't ruin it. And he went out of his way and he was like, don't ever say anything. I'll deny it. And I just just come home. Here's, here's a ticket. Everything's paid for. Get home. But then we we find that out through Ted, et cetera, et cetera. But the episodes leading up to that. You know, Marshall's like, oh, you know, what are you guys talking about? Uh, we're talking about um, uh, Lily. And then Barney like gets up and he walks out. He just he just doesn't want to hear. It, right. So there's many episodes like that. Um, we learned that the real reason Barney was stealing all the women from Marshall to mess it up is because he was trying to keep him from not being with Lily. Right. He was trying to help his friend. Now, if you watch the show from the beginning with this new inf information, you see Barney in a different light. You know that he has a redeeming arc and you know that a lot of the stuff he's doing is really subverted. You know, there's something deeper going on with him. Basically, one of the biggest reveals is he literally got an evil job, evil job to take down the boss of a corrupt business. But he did it to get back at him for stealing his girlfriend. So, yeah. Yeah, he it was a long con to take out a guy who, you know, peace uh, stole stole his girlfriend, which was established, I think, in, in season two, maybe. But uh, the whole the whole. Thing. So th that's interesting. You know, he has like these redeemable elements, but he's still, you know, you know questionable. All right. Another element that really helps uh, readers care about your your novel characters is uh, the third thing. Uh, these, by the way, there are more than three things, but these are just three things I'm going over. Likeability. I'm sure you hear this often. I personally don't like this one. That is why it's last on this list of three. But I do want to talk about it and kind of give you my perspective. Likeability is something that comes with two with the two above elements of redeeming factors and their point of views. Why I have likeability on this list is all because I'm going to turn it on its head. A person doesn't have to be kind, funny, passionate, or have a talent to be likable. They need to have substance, substance to be likable. Magneto is a character we like and we root for because we understand them. The main reason he has motivation that we can relate to. So that's the main reason we can like him. He has a point of view, a strong point of view that we can really philosophically understand. We might not agree with it, but we understand it. 
He also has redeeming qualities that are just overshadowed by his evil deeds. And, you know, when you look at Magneto, the character isn't written like, how can we make him likable? How can we make him like funny or, you know, whatever the case may be. It's through the development of that character and how we will redeem them or just, again, if we go back to their missions, morals, and purposes, how their purpose, right? The purpose, that inner hope. Magneto has an inner purpose to, to protect and survive uh, Homeo Superior, right? The, the mutants. Uh, his mission is to free them and eradicate uh, homo sapiens, the humans, uh, and his morals, though, are really the questionable spot. However, one of his morals is loyalty. So even though he fights Charles and the X-Men, he is loyal to the mutants. But more importantly, he is loyal to Charles Xavier. And these elements make us at least understand Magneto so we can appreciate him. OK, unlike someone like Toad in the first X-Men. He's just somebody that jumps around and has a tongue. He doesn't really have a point of view. Okay. If we look at Jules Winfield and Vincent Vega, uh, they are more than just two hitmen in Pulp Fiction. What's interesting about their characters is that they have lives. They have fears, concerns. They even have enlightened, enlightened moments and the ability to change or grow. They both have very strong perspectives, positions in what they feel is right and wrong. Also, being a hitman is just a job, not a desire. They don't desire to kill people. It's their job. They're going to work and they're talking about hamburgers and vacation time, massaging feet, etc., etc. Right? Then they have to turn on their game face. So even before they go in, they go, hold up. And then they just talk about the footman and they go, all right, let's do this. And they go in. They shoot a guy who stole from their boss who is a criminal. The boss is a criminal. And they're avenging the criminal's boss as per the paycheck. On the surface, they are basically murderers working for a businessman who is a criminal. But we like them because of what's underneath their truth in the form of substance. We can look at both Vincent and Jules and see that they have missions, morals, and purposes. They have the morals of why they do what they do. They have a mission and they have a purpose, right? They also, one has a redemption arc, that's Jules, right? And we're seeing these characters grow and develop. So it's important for you to look at your characters as more than just what needs to happen. Like, I just need them to do this thing. That's a Toad. So Toad and X-Men is, I need Toad to eat the bird with his tongue. I need Toad to steal Cyclops's eye thing. I need Toad to fight Storm. And then I need Toad to be uh, the thing that happens to all things that get hit by lightning. Dumbass line. Uh, anyway, but look at your characters based on a couple elements. What is their mission in life? What is their motivation? What is their want? What is their desire, right? Uh, basically, why does this story exist? What do they want to get out of this story, right? And then the morals will decide their, their yes and no's, like basically their choices. And then the purpose is really what are they fulfilling inside? What is that deeper fulfillment? Um, and use that. And then on top of that, it's not necessarily about a redemption, but you want to see your characters making mistakes. And then taking accountability. They don't have to do it all the time. They don't have to make mistakes all the time. And they don't have to take accountability all the time. But you want it to be there. And it's okay to challenge your characters in that way. All right. Final thoughts. If you really want to get people to like your characters, you need to challenge them beyond their successes. When they succeed, how do they react to that success? This is challenging your characters. Basically, What's the consequence of being rewarded? On the opposite side, what happens in their failure? How do they respond to failure? To clear that up, what I'm saying is a character is defined by their choices and the reactions to the results or the consequences to their choices. If they are rewarded or 
they are punished, which are the consequences. They're, they're either, you know, how do they react to it? And that's more telling of your characters. If your characters are consistently being rewarded and striving with that and not having any change to their personality, you might want to go back and not necessarily create failures for them, but reevaluate their response to that positive consequence and or negative, depending. Let your characters have a growth through their choices. And while they have these choices, let them fail occasionally. It's okay not to be perfect. You also want them to have a point of view and not just be an instrument to get through the story. What is their point of view? What is their stance? Where do they see themselves? And this point of view comes through their missions, morals, and purposes. Basically, they are on the roller coaster uh, that gets them through the scene because they have to, or they are on a roller coaster because they chose to be there. They notice the roller coaster's broke ahead. And do they worry about themselves being saved, saving the people on the roller coaster? Or there's a million other choices. But the point is, in that situation, they can't get on a roller coaster. The roller coaster breaks, so it stops. Then they reverse the roller coaster, and they get off it, and then they go to the next ride. That's things are happening. But if they get on the roller coaster, and the roller coaster goes all the way through without any issue, and then what's their growth? What is their response to that? Do they just go to the next ride? What if that's their first roller coaster and they were nervous to get on it? And now they're like, I love roller coasters. Let's go on it again or another one. Or what if they already love roller coasters? They get on it. What is the positive consequence to that? You know what? They love how much fun their friends had and how they could connect with their friends and they have they, there's growth to their friendships. Whatever. You have to create a response to the result, whatever it is. And that that's through character choices, okay? Um, you know, and, and another thing to add to that, uh, you want to allow them to have an opinion on that roller coaster. They don't want to get on it. They have fears or hei of heights, etc. whatever it is. Basically, add some sort of element or value to the response to that situation. They could love the the roller coaster, but does someone else hate it? Does someone else have a fear? Did they get on and the stranger has a fear? Does someone else say, oh, did you know, like before they get on, did you know, like last last month, this uh, roller coaster actually, uh, the roller coaster cart flew off, right? Create something and then allow them to react to it. Do they think, uh, maybe we shouldn't go on this roller coaster? Or do they go, well, that, they, they had to have fixed it. Let's go on it. And what's the consequence of either one of those choices? Overall, likable characters are a mixture of who they are inside, how they respond to things, and what they want. It's not that they are funny. It's not that they are passionate. It's not like they're not a, a, a an adjective. Or they're not a, a an adverb. They're not a they're not anything but their choices. It's who they are inside and how they make choices based on what's thrown at them that makes a character likable. When I read, uh, blah, blah, blah. when a reader can relate to any of those elements, they become likable. When they see them making choices, good or bad, and they're dealing with them, good or bad, and their consequences are not always perfect and not always bad, and how they deal with it, that's where we as readers become interested. And we say this character is likable. Do you have to have all these elements? No. But you do You do have to have one of them to get the character to be more than the evil person or the good person or the love interest or the protagonist, the antagonist or the toad. Anyway, allow characters to be more than the purpose they serve in a story and allow their purpose to serve them in their story. Next video in the series. The next video in the series will uh, be on how to name your characters in a novel. And no, we're not just going to go with Jack being nimble. <laughs> I have no idea what that joke was supposed to do for anyone, but uh, I put it there. Things we'll cover is techniques to find names for your characters, have meaning behind the names, and ways to make up new names without them just being a... <laughs>
jumbling of letters. My question to you is what makes your best friend so likable in your mind? Let me know in the comments below. And if you like what you've watched and you've not yet done so already, uh, please subscribe and hit that bell icon so you don't miss out. All right, that was exciting. Okay, that's the video. As always, keep developing the right mindset. I'll see you next time. Love you all. Thank you so much. I appreciate it.